Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, I'm here at SHOT Show today with Mike Branson of Gideon Optics. And uh, we're asking Mike a series of questions about optics that I don't really know a good answer to. And Mike, you have fairly extensive experience in this field. I'm basically like a comic book nerd, but optics are my comic books. <laughs> the perfect <laughs> person to talk to here. So, yeah. Yeah. Mike previously worked with Primary Arms on their optics. You worked with Swamp Fox on their optics, and now you're with Gideon yeah. Optics. Yep, I'm in startup mode again. Yeah, it's fun. All right. So our question today is: We see a lot of prism optics out there. Yeah. And there are pros and cons to them. People talk about how you know if you have an astigmatism, you don't have an issue with uh, a, with the reticle. With yeah. the reticle, like you would with a red dot, they don't need a battery. You know, if the battery dies, it's not illuminated, but you still have your reticle, unlike a red dot. My question is, I've got old school fixed power scopes from yeah. World War II, World War One. What's the difference between that and a prism optic? Yeah, so uh, I love I love this question because I love prism scopes. So what personally fascinates me about prisms is that the what the light does as it goes through a long fixed power scope. So let's think about the old, uh, like eight power unertals, you know, with the external adjustments, right? And it's as long as the rifle barrel, right? Huge, it's like over a foot long. Oh yeah, it's like the old pirate spyglass. Right? right, yeah, just we put it on top of a rifle. So all of those lenses that are stacked up and all of the things that they do to the light, this one magnifies it and then this one flips it and this one holds the reticle and like, all of that stuff is, the prism scope does all those same things. The okay. light does, the light, does all the same stuff, but because of the prism, the, the magic of that little triangle-shaped prism, we can make it, we just shrink it down, it's compacted. So okay. the light has a different path, it's a short path and it kind of zigzags around in there, you know, magic happens inside. But, but if you took the prism features and you strung them out in a row, you'd have an 8-power unertal. It's really the same thing, it's just shrunk. Which I think is fascinating. So it is technologically different. Oh yes, it's absolutely. Same same end end result, but different means of getting. It. Absolutely, yes. Now there were old school prism sites like the Warner and Swayze yes. that the US used. Yes, that, I loved your video. If you haven't seen his Warner and Swayze video, it's awesome. Yes. That everyone thinks of as a prism because you look in here and you look out over there, and it. Does it's a, a prism job. scope. It absolutely is. Now, in 1917 or 1918, there it was. Now, yeah. it's, but it's got a, a, a dog like in it. That right. doesn't. Right. Is that because? Well, why? why? Yeah, right. Let's just go straight to why. So the the Warner and Swayze is what they call a Poro prism, and it's basically what you get from an old pair of field binoculars. Okay. So they basically took a set of binoculars that had been around since you know the 1800s, and cut it in half. Said, well, we don't need the left eye. We'll take the right half of the binocular. We'll put it on a mechanical mount. You got those big wheels. So there's no internal adjustments at all on the Warner and Swayze. You got those big wheels that you're spinning and locking and they're marked with ridiculous oh, yeah. ranges out to 4,000 yards and all, the, all these sort of hopes and dreams ranges that you'll, that you'll never actually see in real life. But it's basically they took half of a Poro Prism binocular, stuck it on top of a rifle and made a click value adjustment to steer it around to, to change your point of aim and point of impact. Okay. It, was, it was brilliant for the time period because it was small and relatively light and had relatively good glass and it had a neat reticle in it with, with the kind of ridiculous ranging that, yeah. again, oh, I know that guy is 4,000 yards away now because he fits it, you know, but, but that was that time period. And relatively high magnification for its time. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other crazy thing about prisms is that they grow exponentially with magnification. Okay. So, like, this is our little Advocate 1X prism. It's on an Aimpoint T1 footprint, so anything that an Aimpoint will go on, this will go on. It's a, it's a straight one power. It's super small. It's, a, it's only a couple of inches long, right? But if we were to make a 5X prism, look at, look at the Swamp Fox Saber 5X, or look at the, the, uh, the Trigicon ACOG 5.5. It's massive. So they grow exponentially as magnification increases, which I think is, is fascinating too. Okay. Um, so it's actually more efficient to do a small prism than a large one? Yes. Are and you? I think that's why nobody's ever made like a 10 power prism. Okay. I got a, I got a 1 to 10 LPVO back here that's, you know, pretty small and light, relatively speaking, and it's easy to handle. If I tried to make a 10 power prism scope, it would be massive. It'd be like the Hubble Space Telescope on top of your gun, right? So this is, this is not a Poro prism, this is a roof prism. Okay. So it's still a prism design, but it's a different prism structure. You can Wikipedia all this stuff. 
and the prisms are aligned differently with themselves and everything's in a line. So internally, it's not like the binoculars or the Poro prism, Warner and Swayze. It's a different arrangement. It's a more modern arrangement and it has a lot of benefits. They just didn't have that in 1918. It hadn't been invented yet. You beat me to it. That was gonna yeah. be my next question. Yeah, why wouldn't they do that then? Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, so the, the, the roof prism was invented, I'm not sure when, but you'll see roof prism binoculars now where the binocular, like go to the Vortex booth and they got roof prism binoculars and it just goes straight through. It doesn't have the dog leg anymore. Okay. Same thing as this, really. So I understand that at large magnification, the prism has a, a size problem. Yeah. At yeah. low magnification, what's the pro-con trade-off between a roof prism and a regular traditional tube optic? Well, yeah. So I would say really the tube optic, like for, uh, for something like this, it's a 1X. Your competition tube optic is a red dot. So a red dot has the advantage of not having an eye box or an eye relief. These have a very uh, forgiving eye box and eye relief, but it's not the same as it's not the same technology as the dot. So they've so, gotten much much better. But so that, sorry, let me yeah, interrupt no, you. For back, one back, that's because the red dot is just an open tube that's got a dot projected into it, and you're physically just like there are no lenses changing the light. This the light's bouncing around, so what comes out here isn't just a hollow straight view through the tube. Exactly right. Okay. Yes, exactly. So you're not, that's also why uh, uh, backup iron sights through a prism can be problematic because you ah. think they're lined up and you think, oh, well, this will work. And then you actually fire a shot to zero and the light bounced around a dozen different ways in here. So it's not seeing that front side on this MP5 where it really is. Okay. So yeah, so that can be problematic too. Um, I never actually thought about yeah. that. That makes sense. Yeah. But so so this, it's really forgiving. I can hold it all the way out here like this. And I can still see the dot. Sorry. <laughs> Shot show. The guy just raised his hands over there. Like, <laughs> Sorry about that. Or I can come really in close like this and I can glue my eye to this and I can still see there. So it's really forgiving. But if I do this, I can't see anything at all. I see black. It's just a black sheet, right? With a red dot, I would have a dot sort of in the corner, right. and it wouldn't be ideal, but I could take a shot and get a hit. Okay. So so this has an S reticle in it. Like you said, if the battery dies, or if it's I'm shooting a white painted steel at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I just shut it off and I use the reticle in black, which a red dot can't do. Once, once the dot's off, you're done. And with guys like me with astigmatism, I never really see like a perfect three MOA dot. Oh, I see like a, a, a little comet with a tail, yeah. or I see like a bow tie, and I just have to fight through it. I, I mess with my brightness settings until I, it, I get what I like and, and I fight through it. But if you have major eye issues, these also have an adjustable ocular to keep the, the reticle sharp. Okay. Um, another, another, we were talking about military RFPs in the, in the previous video. ACOGs don't have that. You know why the Trigicon ACOG does not have an adjustable ocular? Is it because there's basically a military spec standard for young eyeball that's going to use it? That's right. It's <laughs> an infantry, it, it was built to an RFP for an infantry weapon. If you don't have 20-20 vision, you're not infantry, so you're not going to get issued one. So why would me make it adjustable for different eyeballs when we have a military standard eyeball? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it makes it uh, less complex, there's less moving parts, so the ACOG becomes tougher when you take out that complexity. They have that big forged, you know, the forged uh, uh, super tough housing, and it's just as simple as they could make it because they wanted to be as tough as they could. Okay. Yeah. So if you hit that middle ground, of, let's say three power, three and a half power, prism versus tube optic. Ooh, I actually like prisms a lot, I really do. Uh, you can get a lot of field of view out of a prism and there's less to mess with. You can save weight, you can save money. Uh, they can be less expensive. You can get a lot of work done at 3X. Okay. You know, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I do this a lot and I like to shoot a lot, but for me personally, you know, on a square range with a target that has good contrast, I'm good at 500 yards with a 3X prism scope. I can do that all day. Okay. Now, you know, now if it's dusk and the guy's wearing camouflage, I'm in a military situation and everybody's hiding from each other, okay, that's different. But again, that's not really my application. I'm, I'm just the guy. Um, but yeah, you can get a lot of work done with the 3X and they're more compact. It's super simple. You never have to worry about, oh, my magnification is wrong or any of that stuff. Uh, I'm a big Prism fan. I really am uh, in the low powers. 
when you get past 5x, it's time to go with, with the tube optic. Which explains why the high magnification ACOGs are such gigantic. They're, they're huge and they're expensive and you don't really see them very often. Yeah. You see them in, in niche cases. There's niches where they, where they work well, but clearly they're not the most popular of the ACOGs. And there's not really a practical way to have a, a adjustable magnification on an ACOG. <laughs> right, or on a, so... A prism. Like, it's been tried. So you know the Spectre right. DR, and you had the Russian one well, for a while, yeah, right? Yeah. And the problem that you come with is, is that, uh, the traditional problem with that is you get a point of impact shift. That's when exactly you move, you throw the little lever and it doesn't hit the same. So what happens with that a lot is the, you zero on the magnified, and then you just sort of accept that I'll be close at one power. But in military, when you look at like the Elkans, in military terms, you know what you see those on a lot is belt feds. Okay. Because if I'm gonna have a little point of impact shift, why not put it on a cone of fire, sustained fire weapon that's firing five or six shots at a time and I've got a cone of fire anyway. So what do I care if the, if the impact shifted a little bit at one power? It yeah. doesn't really matter that much. So you see them on belt feds a lot. So everything has its place. Um, and it's a question of how nitpicky do you want to be? You know, if you want to be super precise, maybe that's not the optic for you. If you're if you're behind an M240, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> All right, so you have a one power prism. Does Gideon have other options in prism scope? This is our first one. All right. So it's a little two hundred and thirty dollar one X prism scope, super forgiving. With the latest generation of these one X prisms, you can use a magnifier behind them. The okay. old ones you couldn't. There was eye relief issues, and, and so that's kind of fun and exciting. The other thing is. Talking about the old Warner and Swayze, it was all external adjustments. Right. Now we've got really nice turrets in these. They're, they're flush, they're compact, you can't break them off. They're a half MOA per click. The clicks are nice and sharp. That's another thing that's happened in the last 100 years. That you just, even the old Unertals, like we were talking about, the tube scopes, they were externally adjusted, right? So yeah. the ability to internally adjust an erector tube inside this, you know, with the prism housing in it, uh, is a giant is a giant step forward. Somebody yeah. tell Elcan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're traditional that way. They 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 like the external adjustments, and you know, there's nothing that's perfect. They they don't want the complexity inside the scope. Right. They want the scope to be as uh, to be with one piece. Through. Yeah, it's it's one piece as possible. So if you're gonna make nothing moving inside the scope, you got to make the whole scope move. So that's their choice. That's the way they went with it. It's not necessarily an invalid choice, but they are the only ones currently still. Still using that that technology, yeah. Cool. I love prism scopes, and you should too. They're underrated. They're underrated, and you can get in in military service. They've got a lot of work done for many, many, many years, and uh, I respect that quite a bit. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Gideon Optics. If you would like to get yourself a nice, inexpensive, fun. Uh, give a, yeah. Give a These are great on PCCs. Just point it and go. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys.